Elbridge with North Central Regional Center for Rural Development, and we're pleased to host this session today on um, community decision making and, and how different approaches might work better for different groups. Uh, we've got several presenters today. I'll be on myself and Rachel Wellborn from the Southern Rural Development Center, as well as two of the CAPE project team members, uh, Courtney Cuthbertson who's uh, uh, playing a dual role as the project postdoc and also uh, working on uh, the North Central Region uh, coordination. And Jessica Tess, who is our social media expert. And so with that, I think we'll launch uh, with our project partners, SAMHSA, the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Service Administration, uh, coordinated and supported by the USDA, and also um, the regional world center. So, uh, Rachel, you have the next slide. All right. Well, I am going to just provide a little bit of an overview of community decision making in general to start our conversation. So, I just want to share with you some things that kind of guide decision making and how we can look at this across the community. So, we'll just take just a minute. And as we think about this from the title, we saw that you know one size does not fit all. There are a lot of different ways that communities can make decisions and that they can involve the members of the community as they think through tough issues such as these that we're dealing with. As we look through this, some of the things that we can think about in this continuum are low end and high end across here and some of that is about community engagement. How much are we involved in the community members in the decisions? But along with that we also look at time commitment involved, how much input we want to give the community, how much power the community will have in the decision, but also community buy-in. And as you take as we look at different methods and different ways that we can approach this community model, we'll see that these will fluctuate. So we'll be sharing some of the different elements of this and then also giving you some examples of how this can work in communities. If we start on the low end, low involvement, these are things that we, we typically think of as one-way communication. Newspapers, a, a static website, email reminders, fact sheets, they tend to be one way with the power usually remaining with what I'm going to call the authority or the person controlling resources. They're quick, they're to the point. They, they get information to the community, but there's not much going back in the other direction. Not much feedback loop. There are times when this is a very appropriate method, such as when decisions have to be made quickly, when a decision is already made or there are limited options and the authority just has to go ahead and make those decisions. You know, I think from our, our recent storms from last week, these, these serve as great examples of a time when we're not going to sit down and have a community deliberation about what to do with the tornado that's going to be at our doorstep in five minutes. We want to know and we want to act. So there are times when this is a very, very appropriate way for leaders to communicate with the community that really don't allow much opportunity for community members then to, to do feedback. They are just acting on the information they've been given. But then if we look at the middle of the continuum, we can see that these elements that we discussed in that first slide are beginning to shift some. So now we have two-way communication happening. We've got leaders and community members that are, are dialoguing back and forth, but the power still remains with the authority or the, the decision makers. The decision, though, should be influenced by public opinion. So the public is giving some feedback, they're telling what they think should happen, but that power is still remaining with the people that are holding the purse strings. The time can vary on these approaches from something that takes a few minutes, like a survey, to something that maybe takes several hours, such as a, a town hall meeting. So there are some, again, some appropriate uses of this type of engagement, such as when there's some sort of decision to be made, 
and the authorities need some feedback or sometimes it's even required that they get community feedback before they act. Another time when this is useful is when there's limited options. We can't just go out and say, hey, community member, what do we want to do here? But instead it's, well, we can do this, or this, let's talk pros and cons and get some feedback on which way to go. And then there are some times where legally the authorities must retain control of decisions so they may not have the option of opening it for the community to take that power but they can get their input on different options that are available. So we see these sometimes in town hall meetings, we see these in you know, different kinds of, of dialogue sessions where community members are given an opportunity to react to something that the community is deciding, yet that control is still and that final decision is still laying with the, the community decision leaders. And then on the far high end of civic engagement is this idea of complete collaboration and empowerment of community members. And it's, just, it's depicted by this little circle of chairs. All voices are equal, whether this is a, a mayor, a county commissioner, a citizen, it doesn't matter who they are, everyone sits down is equal at the table and the decisions are made collectively. This is a very time-intensive approach. It takes a lot of time to bring people together and to get them comfortable with this kind of conversation and then to move forward. However, it is very, very, very valuable in getting public buy-in. And I apologize, there's a letter that's covered up there that is supposed to be essential. That whenever the community really needs to have complete buy-in to what's happening, when the issues are very, very complex and require having lots of different perspectives to make any lasting difference, then this approach can be an excellent option. So if we think about this continuum, and just the one size doesn't fit all, we're going to go into some examples of the field. And we're not specifically going to talk much about the low end because I think we're all pretty familiar with newspapers and aesthetic websites and the way that that looks. But we are going to give an example from kind of one of these intermediate approaches of where you've got the give and take between citizens and leadership. And then we're going to give one example of looking at more of the high end, so the truly collaborative, everybody sitting down together approach. And then look a little more at social media. So I'm going to turn this over to Cheryl to give us one example from the field. All right, so I'll share with you one example of how a high involvement can happen. In the Southern Rural Development Center, we led a series just a few years ago called Turning the Tide on Poverty. We still have some communities that are working through this process. But it is an example of how this, might, this approach might work in solving other difficult community issues, such as those around behavioral health. So this is a kind of a, a diagram of what the process looks like, and we affectionately have been calling this our football field. It looks a little like a football field in the way that it's laid out. But if we're moving over here from the left side, to the right, this kind of shows how this process lines out. It, as I mentioned, these high-end engagement processes do take a lot of time, so there is a, a, a part in which this is just about organizing. It's bringing together the people that will help get participants together, training facilitators that can help run the process, and get the people engaged in the circles as they go. Our process started with a kickoff in which we brought together people from all over the community and invited them to come together to just hear about what was going to be happening. This particular one was around poverty, but the same process could be used about a lot of issues. We brought them together, discussed what was going to be happening, and then this was kind of a sign-up night where they joined in on the circles. So as you move to this next phase of community circles, you can see all these little dots on here and they represent groups that were meeting all over the community over the next five weeks. 
So they met once a night, well, it was, I'm sorry, once a week over the five different weeks, and they met at different places, and they met at different times, but they, during that same week, during week one, all of the groups that met were discussing the same questions, and they were walking through the same process. At the end of the five weeks, each one of these circles brought their best ideas together to an action forum. And during this action forum, the groups would share their ideas about what could be done about poverty in their community, as that was the topic. And then from this, there was a consensus building process in which the community decided on the action teams that they thought would be most successful in the community. And so from that point, people signed up for the action team that most interested them or most fit with their abilities. And so now we're to this point where we're seeing some real community change and it's taken on a lot of different forms. Some of these are represented by this next slide. We've got some groups that focus specifically on meeting the basic needs of food and they did that in a couple of ways. We have some community markets that started, we have some food pantries that started or expanded, but we also, as kind of shown by the this picture on the bottom left, we have some groups that are teaching community members how to garden. And so it becomes a, a sustainability skill building of, of how do you garden, how do you produce your own food so that you're not as dependent on others whenever you don't have the income to go buy your food. Some of the other opportunities though came around workforce development. We had several that had started things about skill development to help people either get better jobs or to get jobs if they're unemployed or unemployed. So these were GED classes, some of them were computer classes, some of the soft skills such as writing a resume or learning different programs. So the, the types of initiatives that came out of the community were very much community driven, very much based on what that community saw as most important. Some of the things that we saw this the picture here on the, the upper right was even about reclaiming space in the communities and about community betterment in general. In this one community, there was a, a fairly impoverished neighborhood that had no safe place for the children to play and for people to walk. So they reclaimed a football field from an old high school that was in that neighborhood that was, had just was in disrepair. They turned it into a walking trail and they put, they've taken the concession stand and turned it into a farmer's market. And so now there's this great community space that not only is improving the health of people, it's also giving them greater access to the fruits and vegetables that they might not be able to get otherwise. So just as one example of how this high-end process works, there's some, some fabulous outcomes that are coming from this process, but it is very time intensive. It does take a lot of work. But the buy-in and the opportunities on the other end are, are re very amazing. So with that, Scott, do you want to go on and talk through the social media? A little time talking about how to use social media in community decision making. And so I want to start with giving just a few reasons um, why a social media component can be very useful in the community decision-making process. Um, first of all, with social media, you can have information publicly broadcasted um, and your news can travel at the speed of light. It's a tool where you can share opinions very readily. Um, also, because social media has really taken off in recent years, some people have really come to prefer it and will shy away from other forms of communication like the postal service, email, and telephone. So um, there's a significant audience that um, local leaders can involve if they're willing to reach out with social media channels. Um, also, considering how much we've talked about the pros and cons of time involvement and um, the amount of time different types of 
deep involvement can take. When used appropriately, uh, social media can really help in being a big time saver while still getting some of the deeper types of involvement in community decision making depending on your circumstances. Um, and actually, I'm, there we go, this is the slide I want to be on. Um, so I'd like to give one quick example um, about how social media can um, cut some time and still bring um, leaders to be deeply involved in discussing um, issues with their community. I want to use one example from um, the communities within a community concept uh, with police departments. So this was an initiative that originated in 2002 uh, with the police department. They really wanted to put an effort to address uh, goals in the area of their community um, and to better serve various communities within their city. And so with this initiative, they wanted to um, have greater communication, greater community outreach. They wanted to um, improve their service to the community and build trust and partnerships, things like that. And so with this initiative in 2002, officers met with various communities in their city, such as the Latino community, the African American community, the gay lesbian community, um, and they asked them questions like, what do you like or dislike about our services? Are you getting what you need? Um, what is what are you getting that you don't need? What could you be getting more? Um, so long story short, this process was very beneficial for their community and their city, but it was very time consuming and very labor intensive. So uh, in 2012, a different police department took this idea, this concept, and um, instead put the concept online to use social media um, to carry out the same process. Um, and so specifically, as they started getting feedback from different communities um, and started addressing those issues um, via their Facebook page, posting responses um, to people's concerns, they really had an overwhelming response of thanks um, from their community, and it, and it went off without a hit without a hitch, I should say. Um, so if we take an example like that and some of the other benefits that I mentioned at the beginning, um, especially towards more behavioral health-centric situations, I think um, you know there's a lot of strategic ways to use social media in community decision making here too. Um, so some of the things that uh, local leaders can do through social media campaigns is start conversations uh, with their community. They can ask opinions. Um, even disseminate polls or spread certain kinds of information. I've got two examples up here. Um, the first uh, image on the top right um, shows a recent campaign that was just carried out in order to spark conversation about mental health because May is Mental Health Awareness Month. Um, where this campaign called Text Talk Act invited people to um, text a certain number and participate in a series of conversations with people around them in their communities about mental health um, and then report how those conversations went online. Um, and so this was, um, this right here was a national campaign, but it certainly could be uh, implemented in local or regional areas as well. The second example I have up here of uh, a campaign like this, you see I have a tweet here posted from a Twitter account called Time to Change. They are also very concerned about mental health problems. Um, and so they post some information on their Twitter account about how you can start your own conversation about mental health problems. Um, and so depending on what your goals are uh, in your local area, um, social media is a way to um, reach certain audiences in less time, spark conversations, um, and so it can be a very, um, it can be a good advantage to include this in your strategy for um, certain decisions you want to make as a community. Um, so any questions about that, feel free to ask at the end. But at this point, I want to turn it back over to um, whoever's next, whether that's Rachel or Dr. Leverage. Actually, I think it's Courtney. Yes. Um, so I will be starting here with our overview of resources. 
Um, and what I'd like to tell you all about today is um, part of what the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention have put together. Um, they developed this in about 2007. They've been working with a number of different communities on this um, assessment and uh, data collection tool that is called the CHANGE tool. Um, and CHANGE, um, as you can um, see here, is um, the community health assessment and group evaluation. So this um, is a about a hundred page community assessment guide uh, that also comes with some Excel spreadsheets and some worksheets uh, that it's is meant for community members um, to use to gather and organize data on a number of, of different community issues in a number of different community sectors. Um, the benefits here are that this is done by um, local stakeholders and leaders who work together through the, a collaborative process in surveying their, their community. The CDC estimates that depending on community characteristics that it would take three to five months to complete this tool and they recommend that it could even become an annual evaluation tool so that communities can track over time how well they're improving in different community behavioral health issues. So the change action uh, tool has an eight step plan and I will go through each of these steps. Um, if anyone would like more clarification um, through the question and answers, I'm, I'm happy to do that. Um, so this first step that they have is to assemble the community team. Um, what they recommend is having no more than 10 to 12 individuals that would be represented there. Um, so these can be people from a number of different areas in the community. It could be um, someone who is in church leadership or a faith leader, um, someone who is the CEO of a local um, business or uh, a community organization like the YMCA the parks and recreation director or general community members, as you can see in their um, diagram here. Uh, what they want is that there would be diverse representation from the community and that each member would play an active role um, in the process of collecting data and assessing it. So the second step for the change tool is to develop a particular strategy for the team. Um, part of this strategy is for the, the team to define what community means for them because community can mean a lot of different things. So the CDC recommends that, that each team f creates the definition of community that best fits the context um, in which the team is working. So it could be an entire city, it could be a town, a county, a neighborhood, or some other area. Um, the part of this um, team strategy is also whether the leaders want to work as a whole team or to divide into subgroups. And most who have worked with the change tool will divide into subgroups with um, two people working together in teams and then they report back to the, the larger group. So the third action step here um, is to review all of the five change sectors. So um, there is the community at large, which includes any kind of community-wide efforts that impact the social and built environments. Um, then there are community institutions or organizations, um, which are any, inst uh, any entity within the community that provides uh, a, a broad range of human services, access to facilities. Um, one example would be a health and wellness organization. The next sector, sector that they delineate is the healthcare sector, which is um, places that people would go to to receive some kind of treatment or preventative care, um, emergency health care services. The school sector is uh, any primary or secondary learning institution and then worksite is any place of employment. So the change tool um, requests or, or wants the teams to pick at, at least two places in the community that would fit into each of these um, five sectors and 
within each um, sector, the modules are specific um, in terms of types of questions that they, they want to know about. So there are questions about the leadership in each of these sectors, um, chronic disease management, physical activity, nutrition, uh, and then tobacco use as well. Um, and in the school uh, sector, there are also questions about after school programs and the school district um, in general. So after reviewing these sectors and figuring out which parts of the community are going to work really well, the, the next step is to gather data. And there also has to be a strategy here from the leaders in terms of thinking about which data collection methods to use. So they, the CDC really recommends that there are at least 13 sites um, that are included in this. And there are a number of different ways that the leadership team here can get information from each of these places. Um, I can go in more depth um, about each of these if you'd like me to um, through the, the question and answer. But um, generally, they, they say that you could do observations. You could, you could stand in a particular spot in a neighborhood to watch um, for safety concerns, for example, or how much tobacco use is happening in a particular area. Um, the photo voice uh, method is one that's interesting. Um, it would involve more community uh, participation where community, mem community members are taking pictures of their community and um, then engaging in dialogues about what the pictures represent, um, what kind of concerns are there, that kind of thing. Um, and then there's a number of types of surveys that can also be used. So the goal through data collection um, is really to engage the community members to make sure that the voice of the community is heard um, by using these different diverse methods. So after gathering the data, the next step um, is to review all of that data. And the change tool recommends that the entire leadership team will get together and draw a consensus about how to interpret uh, the data that's been collected, because those are a number of different methods that could be used. So the, there are a number of different ratings also, um, and I'll show you an example of this in just a second. Um, when entering data in the next step, this is where the Excel sheets um, come in that are provided with the change tool. So the Excel sheets um, ask for these different ratings. So we're taking the data that was collected through these this number of different methods. And we're evaluating each site based on um, two different elements. So we can see here um, one of these is policy. So what policies are in place? Um, and then evaluating one. Um, here that it would not be identified as a problem, um, and then incrementally up to five where there is a policy in place about this particular issue, um, and that policy is being enforced and evaluated. They're also evaluated here each, each site on the environment, whether there are certain elements in place incrementally all the way up to all of the elements are in place. So these are the different response categories that the leadership team has to choose from in filling out these um, Excel sheets. So this is just a screenshot here of one of the sheets. And so this is for the community at large. And I apologize, it's a little bit small. Um, but for instance, the first question there says, to what extent does the community institute a smoke-free policy 24-7 for indoor public places? So the community leaders would look at the data that they've collected and decide um, what ranking from 1 to 5 this site specifically should have. Um, in terms of the, the policy here, um, and then also the environmental response. And so there's a number of different questions, um, and then it'll populate um, down here the um, percentage score for that particular site on that item. So this is the tobacco spreadsheet, and as I mentioned before, there are other ones for chronic disease management, um, leadership, um, et cetera. So after entering the data and, and coming up with those uh, percentages as scores for each site, step number seven is to review all of the data as a whole. 
Um, and there are a number of different worksheets and spreadsheets that the CDC provides to enable communities to make quick references for, for these things. So this first one that we see on the screen here is the community at large summary. Um, this would be where um, for the community at large as the sector that we can see that we would have to copy over the scores here, physical activity, nutrition, tobacco use, um, and then fill in some demographic information. And this gives a snapshot of that sector for the community leaders to start thinking about the bigger picture. So each of these steps, um, sub-steps for step seven of reviewing the data are all building towards what can we do with this. So the next um, part of action step seven is to complete the sector data grid. So what this means is that um, we can see there are per percentages up here at the top, and these are based on what those previous spreadsheets have calculated. So each site um, for policy and for environment will be placed in one of these boxes. So it makes it easier to see uh, perhaps where the community at large or where the school um, or work site policies or environment might need some improvement. And it's up to the community leaders to figure out where the line might be drawn in terms of what the assets are that the community has and what their needs are. So what percentage would be ideal for them? Um, and finally, there are also um, the community health improvement planning templates that are provided, which um, here we see it, it says um, sector policy or environmental change strategy. So this is where the leaders are starting to think about what is it that we need to be changing, what is it we need to be working on. Identifying the next steps, what is it that the community leaders can start doing next to work on this issue. Also looking for people in the community that would be able to help with this. So who's going to be taking charge of this next step or this change? Um, and also what's the estimated timeline to be able to complete this? Um, the goal here is to prioritize what is doable given particular time constraints and also the constraint of resources. And the final step here is to build the community action plan. And the community action plan is something that should um, take place over the entire period that the community leaders are considering using the change tool. And the CDC recommends that this plan should be SMART, a nice acronym here. Um, so the plan should be specific in providing the who and what will be involved in making changes in the community. It should be measurable in terms of focusing on how much change is expected. So there should be a, a quantification of the change expected. And through the, the different worksheets, it becomes easier for communities to see that. The, goal, the plan should be achievable. So within a certain time frame and given the available community resources, as I mentioned, it should be something that the communities can do. Um, it should be realistic in terms of accurately addressing the scope of the problem and the different action steps that can be implemented and within reason of what community members could be expected to do. Um, it should also be time phased, so there should be some um, objective measure that should be able to um, be captured within a particular time or there should be a, a period after which we would say, okay, now we're going to look back at those tobacco policies and see how, how much that's changed. Um, so the CDC recommends that there would be project period objectives, so multi-year, a big picture, um, versus annual objectives, what could be accomplished in one year. Um, with the ideal scenario being that a community could use the, the change tool for multiple years. So when we're thinking back about the kind of spectrum, the multiple levels of um, decision making um, with what Rachel was talking about in the beginning, we can see that this change tool occupies um, an interesting place on the spectrum. So there's um, high community engagement for the, the leadership team as they're primarily responsible um, and entirely responsible for the data collection, um, the data entry, the um, data management, and then thinking about evaluating that data as well. Um, there's high time commitment from that leadership team as well. Um, there's moderate community input uh, as the data uh, 
the data collection would have to come from those community members. So the community would have input there. Um, there's high community decision making power because the decisions about priorities and next steps are all set by the community leaders and stakeholders. Um, and it requires moderate community uh, buy-in because the people in the different sites that are chosen to draw the data from have to be willing to participate. Um, but perhaps if teams ran into problems, they could pick alternate sites. Um, additionally, if we're thinking about where the change tool might fit on this spectrum, uh, the tool has already been developed by the CDC. Um, and the data that's collected by the team, although it could be quite diverse in findings and in methods, um, has to be fit into the questions and formats um, of that Excel sheet um, after collection so that the tools are able to be utilized. So I would say that this occupies then perhaps a, a moderate to high point on this spectrum. Um, and this change tool really shows that it's possible for some community decision-making processes to be in between these kind of distinct low, medium, and high categories. Um, and then, Rachel, I think that we've, this part you've got, right? Yeah, I just want to share with you a couple of resources very quickly that are also out there that just may provide some different perspectives on how you may want to work with the community. The National Issues, National Issues Forum is one of those organizations that frequently puts out discussion guides on difficult topics for communities. And so as you can see here, this is just a sampling of some of the things that I pulled from their site on which they've got books already written. The way their forums are typically formatted, they will have three different approaches. So for instance, on the first one, bullying, how do we prevent it? They'll have three suggested approaches. And rather than having the community say, well, we want one over the other, there's a set of questions that the community will use to talk about those. Like, what do we like about this approach? Or what do we not like about this approach? Or what would make this one challenging here? Uh, who may like this idea? Who may not like it? And so that it's just used as a framework to get some community dialogue started. The forum typically ends with just that discussion, so then it's up to the community to build in the next side of that, or the next phase of that, and what are we going to do about it. But there are some very, very nicely done materials on these topics that you see here, along with a, a host of other options that are on the forum's page. So that's one resource that you may just want to explore your leisure. And then the second one, Rural Assistance Center, has got a Rural Mental Health and Substance Abuse Toolkit that I would just encourage you when you get time to go look at that material. There's quite a bit over there and you know, that, that covers several different aspects of this. And it's, it's worth just investigating rather than me trying to give all of the details of what's there. And then finally, I think we've already mentioned this briefly, but Tech Talk Act to Improve Mental Health is exploring the uses primarily of social media as a way to start some dialogue on mental health. So if you look at that, there are different activities and different events set up. And uh, they had one just, I believe it was last week, encouraging people to get in groups of four or five and to the Tech Talk Act process together. So it's a very interesting way of using social media and using the ability to text on a phone to start a dialogue with some friends. So it's clearly, as you can imagine, is geared towards younger people that are that have embraced that technology and are, and are using it pretty much on their daily lives. So with that, I'll turn back over to Scott. Well, thanks a lot, Rachel, and thanks also to Jessica and Courtney for some, some great uh, suggestions and tips and ideas on, on how to do this. Um, you know, the CAPE is, uh, again, is Community ass Assessment and Education to Promote Behavioral Health Planning and Evaluation, and it's a national um, project. Um, some, a lot of the folks that are on today are um, representing uh, the 10 communities that are formally part of the program. Um, but there are also other folks that I believe are not 
um, formerly part of the program. And so I'll talk a little bit uh, to both groups. The, um, the, the communities that are in the program are diverse. They're, they range from very rural to very urban, inner city, uh, central city core uh, communities. So we've got a wide range of community types. Um, you know, there, there's uh, places with high poverty, there are places with lower poverty, there's places that are, um, you know, have uh, substantial minority populations and, and places that uh, are predominantly uh, European American. And so we recognize that there are a, a variety of ways of, of approaching the issues and that, you know, as the webinar title implies, one size does not fit all. So we're presenting a range of ways that communities might engage on these topics of how to deal with um, substance abuse and mental health issues within the community. And so these are, are just some of the tools that uh, we've uncovered as we're moving forward. There's a, a group that is uh, formed out of our technical committee that is doing a very extensive review of all of the different ways that communities might work with um, their stakeholders to improve some of these conditions. And if you think about it, there's really, you know, we talked about a continuum of engagement, but there's also sort of a continuum of, you know, where do you work to address the issue? There's um, certainly treatment uh, of the individual, uh, kind of dealing with the immediate issues of the individual who has uh, some of these behaviors or conditions. But there are also things that can happen uh, to prevent that condition from arising in the first place that might be um, done at the uh, community level. Uh, for example, you know, so just let me give an example of tobacco use. You might, uh, you know, treat the individual with a patch and try to get the person, you know, to be able to stop smoking. Um, but on the other hand, you might, you know, ban smoking in public places and do a community education program aimed at, you know, preteens and teens to, you know, get people to not smoke in the first place. And so that's a continuum, right? And so we're looking for um, interventions that, that take place across that continuum on a variety of issues that are related to um, substance abuse and mental health. And that's going to be put together as a matrix. It is, it is coming together as a matrix. So that when communities identify their top issues, that they have some, not only a process like we've talked about here, or multiple processes, but also, uh, you know, interventions that might take place that arise out of the processes that you engage in. Um, and to supplement that, we're also uh, engaged in a couple different efforts to help the 10 communities in the program identify um, what those issues might be. And, and so we've got, uh, there are a number of, of national and state level indicators that um, get collected on a regular basis and we're uh, assembling those into a, um, a community level profile for each of the 10 pilot communities. And uh, just kind of give you an example of the kinds of data that are available. Uh, this this uh, graphic on the left panel kind of talks about some of these things. And what we've done is we've arrayed them on, on two uh, axes. So here on the horizontal axis, you've got sort of a the trend, you know, how this community that uh, shall remain nameless at this point is doing relative to other communities in the state trend-wise. And then on the vertical axis, you've got in incidence levels. How does the community compare uh, with others in the same state in terms of the percentage of people that uh, display the condition? And so you've got, um, in this quadrant, then you have things where the community is already better than the rest of the state and trending in the right direction. So uh, reductions in, you know, better than, than typical in the state and 
on domestic violence and uh, trending downward uh, better than the rest of the state on mental disorder hospitalization and trending downward. And then in this quadrant, you have the opposite, where they're, they're not doing as well as the rest of the state in terms of the incidence, and it's also trending in the wrong direction relative. Uh, it's trending in the wrong direction, I should say. It's, so it's getting worse. They're already worse than the rest of the state, and it's getting worse. And then, so this is a red light, and these are green lights. And then the other two uh, quadrants, um, over here, the community is uh, worse than the rest of the state, but the trend is to get better. So on smoking, you know, their, their, their incidence is worse, but things are getting better. And then over here, um, and in this case, not very many things showed up in this quadrant. They're, uh, they're better than the rest of the state, but their trend is, is, work, is uh, going in the wrong direction. So uh, you can see that uh, you know drinking um, in this particular county is a negative trend, and it's worse than the rest of the state. Uh, now, on the, the right-hand panel, we have some preliminary data from the survey that we're collecting data on in uh, this particular community. And the community is well, uh, has identified leaders uh, that have some relationship to um, community behavioral health in that community some knowledge, some awareness of that. And we've asked them to rank different conditions um, as, uh, you know, whether it's, it's an issue in the community or not. And, and so then if it gets mentioned a lot of time, it gets a ranking. So you can see that, uh, you know, uh, it, it ranges from alcohol abuse being the number one concern by that group all the way uh, down to sexually transmitted diseases on this chart. It, it, it can go longer, but that's, that's the list here. So, um, so in this particular case, on this preliminary data, and this is really not the full survey from that community, so it could change, but you see the number one ranked issue is also consistent with this data point from the secondary data that says that uh, the incidence is worse than the rest of the state and, it's, and, it, and it is getting worse in that particular community. So there you've got kind of an agreement between the leaders and what the secondary data show. On, um, on drug use, um, there isn't a lot of, of good data on that um, in uh, the secondary data, so that's kind of a blank spot for that community. Uh, child abuse and child neglect, uh, that might fit with uh, this teen pregnancy issue here. Um, and then you get down, and but then there's a specific teen pregnancy that's also mentioned as number four ranked. Um, and it, it looks like things are getting better in the community, so maybe Maybe it's on the right track, and maybe it's not as important to address that, or maybe you still want to address that, and that's kind of a, a community conversation. Um, so you can see that there's uh, you know, different sorts of things that, that come in here. Uh, suicide rate, um, you know, the, the leaders rank that fairly low, um, but there it is. It's sort of uh, uh, a negative a negative trend there. So maybe it's not a problem now, but maybe there's some things that need to happen to keep it uh, from getting getting worse. So this, these are inputs into a, a broader set of community dialogue that can take place. And this is just uh, kind of two example charts um, of, of the kinds of things that we'll be looking at uh, from the sec both the secondary data and then the, the leader survey that we've done. And, and these are really just snapshots, and there's a lot more that is going to be available that I wanted to kind of share with, with what some of the things are starting to look like. So with that, I think um, we're pretty well through our slides. We have a few minutes to, uh, for folks to ask questions. Um, and if you're not already on the, the project um, mailing list, you know, input your your email address, and we'll make sure you get added to that. But uh, let me open it up for questions, or 
you know, other members of the presentation team today, if you've got some things you'd like to add, this would be a good time to do so. There we With go. the Folks preliminary typing. data? Courtney, do you want to talk a little bit more about some of the things that, that we've been uncovering with the matrix while folks type? Sure. So what we've been working on, um, let me see if yeah, I can maybe, pull up maybe a share a little bit really about quick. the. You know, um, what the we've been working on is taking kind of these we're, community we're surveys really and trying way. to see what the important things are that people are pointing out. Um, let me grab it here real quick, and I'll come right. Oh, oh, sure. I'm sorry. My misunderstanding. So we're working on I was thinking a more of the matrix spreadsheet where we're, we're to classifying find as many sort of different um, community behavioral proven, health programs um, that are evidence-based, um, proven as effective. So um, we are looking for ones that are, are primarily in line with what um, the, the CAPE initiative is looking at in terms of community behavioral health, which is a focus on um, mental illness, um, mental health, substance abuse, um, and substance use. So there are, let's see, I'm, I'm filtering through about 500 different programs right now and figuring out um, which ones are, are effective, um, and there are a lot of different interesting ones that engage the communities at different levels. So for example, there are, um, for youth, there's a lot of school-based educational programs that can be run by teachers or as part of after-school programs. And I see we've got a question here. So Melanie asks, will the plot of secondary data of indicators be done for all of the pilot communities? Scott, I think that's a good question for you. Yep, and that's an emphatic yes. We will be doing a, a, a profile of each of the 10 communities that are included in the project. So that should be available fairly soon. We're kind of working on two fronts. So, you know, we're finalizing the data collection on the community leaders and then putting together these profiles. Well, I'm not seeing other questions, so I think maybe we'll call it good. Um, again, uh, you've got our contact information there. You've got you know how to reach us on the pro on the project website. You've got the Facebook address as well as our Twitter account and and my e email address. So um, feel free to be in touch if you have questions moving forward. And uh, please join us um, on Thursday. Um, Jessica will, will be on um, front and center talking more about, uh, you know, how to use these, um, uh, talking about um, some of the information she's been able to cull from various uh, analytical tools that are available about searches. So uh, there are, it turns out there are, are pretty substantial differences in how, um, what people are looking for that relate to the issues uh, that are um, the focus of our project uh, from one region to the next. So, so you'll see that your state might be quite different than the adjoining state on, on who's looking for what kinds of things. So it should be an interesting talk um, and a show um, the power of some of the new tools that are out there um, and another dimension of, of community behavioral health. So please join us. Uh,